Hi there class, if you haven't watched the videos up to this point, I recommend you go back and check them out. Um, the videos do build one on top of another. Um, here is what we will cover in this video. We'll recap the course to this point. We'll talk about calculating pre-money versus post-money valuation. Uh, the value of certain ratios in analyzing a company and its, its growth rate and financing. And we'll also talk about what's called the founder's dilemma. So previously we spoke about how businesses are conceived, that they start with a spark, an idea about how to solve a problem or do something better. We talked about the uh, idea that company starts at, in, at that inception and goes through successive rounds of financing to IPO, uh, something that I call the entrepreneur's journey. This is a conceptual framework about how venture capital works. So you can see all of these rounds of financing. You can see the process for how value is created for each person uh, at each step along the way. And then also some ideals around building accretive value. If you'll remember, accretive means to lay down in layers. And this is how even if new rounds of financing are numerically dilutive, they are accretive in terms of value. So the new investment creates additional value for the previous investor, even though the percentage of the company owned is less. We looked at what investors are looking for at different company life cycle stages. What are the norms and how investors look at risk, investment horizon, and desired rate of return? You'll remember that as a founder, you can't sell your stock right away. By right away, I mean right after the IPO, because you're subject to a lockup period of about six months. And we talked about the ideal time to sell. The ideal time to sell is not necessarily right after your IPO anyway, but rather when you can capture the highest price per share. We talked about the fact that there are only four possible exits to any deal. Cash cow, mergers and acquisitions, IPO, or crash and burn. VCs are only interested in the middle two. Okay, that's our recap. The slides with a pencil icon are tipping you off that that may be a possible quiz question. Up next, we're going to talk about how to calculate pre-money and post-money valuations. I mentioned earlier how a round of funding was a value recognizing rather than a value changing event. But the company is issuing new shares to investors. There is fundamentally more of the company to value. So exactly what is the total amount of the value that gets recognized? Well, think about it this way. The full value of the company is recognized after everything to do with the financing is complete. All the shares are issued, the funds are wired, etc. That final valuation divided by the total shares gives us the price per share for this round. In terms of pre-money and post-money valuations, the price per share is the same. The only thing that changes is the number of shares. With the new investment, the company is going to issue new shares. And so that creates a scenario where it's important to distinguish whether you're looking at the company's total value prior to investment or after investment. And that's what these terms, pre-money and post-money, mean. Pre-money valuation is the market cap, which is calculated as total shares times price per share before investment, where post-money valuation is the market cap after investment. And the only difference there is the number of shares. Here's an example. Let's say you're raising $2 million. It's 1 million shares at $2 per share, and you already have 1.5 million shares issued and outstanding. So the total uh, shares pre-money is 1.5 million, and the total shares post-money is 2.5 million. So the valuation is $3 million pre-money, $5 million post-money. Let's say that you do a B round. Now we're raising $5 million. That's 1.25 million shares at $4 per share. We know the previous total number of shares is 2.5 million. Add the new shares, and our new total number of shares is 3.75 million shares. So the pre-money valuation is $10 million. The post-money valuation is $15 million. Pre-money valuation is 2.5 million shares that we had before times $4 per share, equaling $10 million. Post-money valuation is new number of shares, 3.75 million shares, times $4 per share, or $15 million. Now, why is this important? Well, let's say you go out to raise $5 million on a $10 million pre-money valuation, like we're showing here for the Series B. 
That means the investor would end up owning 33% of the company. But what if you mistakenly said you wanted to raise $5 million on a $10 million post-money valuation? This is like raising your Series B, but the investor only pays a Series A price. Under those terms, the investor would end up owning $5 million worth of shares in the company, which is, and the company would only be worth $10 million. So the investor ends up owning half the company. So in other words, making a pre-money versus post-money mistake could mean the difference between the investor owning 33% or 50% of the company. Let's take a look at another term or two. That's, that does it for pre-money and post-money valuation. We're going to look at the P.E. to PEG ratio. So P.E. ratio, price to earnings ratio, is the price per share divided by the earnings per share. If the P.E. ratio was 1, then the stock would essentially cost exactly the same amount as the company earns in earnings in one year. But investors typically believe that a company will generate profits for more than one year. They believe that a company is going to generate profits into the future. So the price of the stock reflects how far into the future investors are willing to believe the company will continue to make earnings. A PE of 5, for example, would indicate that the stock's current price is worth five years of future earnings. So I've got an example here that might help. Here's two companies, two well-known companies, right? Twitter and the New York Times. Let's compare them, and I'm going to use 2014 numbers because both of these companies are in flux, but 2014 is, is baked in the books, gives us a good example that illustrates how PE ratio works. So in 2014, each of these companies had about the same number of employees, right? 3,600 employees for Twitter, 3,529 for the New York Times. When it comes to sales, the New York Times is outselling Twitter, right? Both are, are selling a, a little over a billion dollars. Twitter's at 1.17 billion. New York Times is almost 1.6 billion in sales. To this point, these companies are pretty comparable. Now let's take a look at their earnings. Holy smokes, right? Uh, the New York Times is earning as, as much in profit as Twitter is losing. No surprise then, the earnings per share for the two companies follows what we see on the line above. Only the New York Times has a P.E. ratio because you've got to have some E to, in order to get a P.E. ratio. But in terms of market cap, look at this. In terms of market cap, Twitter is 11 times more valuable than the New York Times. The question is why? How come? How can a company that's, that's you know, bleeding cash like Twitter be more valuable, not just a little bit, 11 times more valuable than the New York Times, which is otherwise a, a fairly comparable company? And the short answer is that even though Twitter is not making money, investors believe more in its ability to make money in the future than they do in the New York Times. The New York Times is struggling to pivot an outdated paper news model into a, a viable online business. Twitter, on the other hand, hopes to be profitable sometime in the next year, and you know, who knows, maybe investors will be proven right. The point is, is that share price and P.E. ratio, if you have some E, is similar to a discounted cash flow analysis or net present value in that it re represents a value today, a net value, that investors believe is reflective of future performance. So what, uh, what's a good P.E. ratio? How do we know if we're doing well or not? Do we just want it to be as high as possible? Well, there's a few things that we want to consider. Let's look at some average market returns as a benchmark. So the S&P 500 has returned about 10% since 1965. Invest in the S&P, top 500 companies, pretty solid returns around 10% um, for, for most of the last century. How about this? Warren Buffett, a man who's been called the greatest stock market investor of all time, has done about twice as well as the S&P 500 with an average of about 21.4% return. It's pretty phenomenal to have a sustained compounded growth rate like this. Now, some younger companies can have higher growth rates than this, but they could conceivably double the share price every two years for a while. They could do, you know, have phenomenal growth. Typically, P.E. ratios that are above 40% are considered unsustainable, meaning that there's no, no significant long-term ability to maintain that, that level of P-E ratio. Now, you remember this table where we were looking at when is the best time to sell. And even though our growth rate in year two was 
uh, super high at around 75%, we only used a PE ratio of 40 because 75% is in the territory of the speculators. It's unlikely to remain there very long. Now, when the PE ratio matches the growth rate, that's an indication that the company is fair valued. The PE divided by the growth rate gives us the PEG ratio, price earnings over growth ratio. Even that, uh, when that ratio is close to one, then we have a pretty good idea that we're at fair valued. Now, wait a minute. In the video where we discussed the valuation formula, it said we should use an IRR of one or 100%. So why for VCs do we use a super high number, but then turn around and say it's unreasonable for the stock market investor? Isn't one of these just as good as the other? Well, they're super different. The VC is investing during a, a very risky, volatile stage. Companies could grow incredibly fast in the early stages, but mellow out once they're mature enough to go public. I mean, it's possible for VCs to see thousands of percent return by investing in this super volatile stage. But it's also really common for more than half of their deals to fail and create zero return. And that is not a risk that stock market investors are willing to take. So there's this spectrum where the risk is high, the potential reward can be high. And the lower the risk, the lower the potential returns. That covers our PE and PEG ratios. Now with all this business of starting a company, growing the company, raising money, and eventually uh, taking it to IPO, what's the psychology of that like for a founder? As you I mean, this is a, this, the company becomes wildly different from start to finish. Let me introduce you to Noam Wasserman. Noam Wasserman is a professor in the Harvard Business School, and back in 2008, Noam wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review called The Founder's Dilemma. This article was popular enough that in 2012, he wrote a book with the same name. And this book actually became part of the Kauffman Foundation series on innovation and leadership. The Kauffman Foundation is kind of like a VC school um, in Silicon Valley. Now, the backbone of this of the article, The Founder's Dilemma, is the idea that founding entrepreneurs sometimes struggle to give up equity. Uh, the idea that they have to part with absolute control and decision-making authority can be super tough for, for uh, founders. This is hard for two reasons. One is, when you take that first dollar of, of equity investment, it means you now have shareholders to the company. And executives in the company have obligations to all the shareholders. And all the shareholders have certain rights. So it can be tough to, to reckon with managing shareholders. And the other thing that can be really tough um, is that sometimes the founder gets to a point where they should no longer be the CEO. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. When I did the marketing for AdTask, which is now Workfront, uh, right, based here in Lehigh, I was in at AdTask in 2007. The, that was the year the company took their first VC investment. Um, and later, after I left, the CEO there uh, continued to grow the company, but as, at a certain point, the board, which he was the chairman of, uh, but also included uh, members from various investment uh, rounds, that board made the decision that the company would be best served by replacing him with an outside CEO. And I actually heard him talk about this in an interview and just how difficult it was. I, I felt like he was he addressed it with an openness, humility, and vulnerability that really reflected a lot of maturity. But it didn't change the fact that it was super hard for him. And that's not an uncommon experience. At some point, many companies outgrow their origins. And that's what Wasserman's talking about in The Founder's Dilemma. According to Wasserman, only 25% of founders are still CEO at the time the company does its, its IPO. He says that most entrepreneurs want to make a lot of money and to run the show. He calls this being rich or being king. And his research indicates that it's really tough to do both. If you don't figure out which matters to you more, you could end up doing neither. We refer to this as a decision between owning the whole grape or a slice of watermelon. The slice of watermelon is bigger. There is more money in the slice of watermelon than in the whole, whole grape. But there's nothing particularly wrong with owning the grape. It's just that if your dreams are to go big, you probably need to get comfortable with the idea that the slice of watermelon is accretively larger than the grape. That covers our agenda for this video. Um, remember that potential quest test questions are marked with the little pencil icon, and uh, I'll see you on the next video.